I think I'd like to move on to uh, another drug that was just approved, and I'm going to ask um, any one of you that wants to jump in here to tell us about what daratumumab is and what it does in myeloma. So anybody that feels like they haven't said anything, Sagar. <laughs> <laughs> so daratumumab is an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody that works through a number of different mechanisms. It does the all the immune things that we think about, like ADCC and uh, ADCP and CDC in terms of its mechanisms for killing cells. But uh, CD38 also has important signaling pathways within the cell itself that may be important for its single agent activity. And what we've shown um, at ASCO this year, and then uh, Saad Usmani is updating at this meeting, is uh, about a 30% single agent response rate in a median of five prior lines of therapy. And if you think about putting that in perspective, that's sort of like where we were in 2002 with bortezomib, single agent, roughly the same sort of ballpark. And patients are achieving not just a response, but there's some, about 10% achieving a VGPR or better, which I think is even really more impressive. Um, it appears to be independent of the number of prior lines that you've had, at least in this very heavily pretreated group of patients. And I think because of its safety profile, it's a monoclonal antibody, uh, it also lends itself to great partnership, which uh, there's data at the meeting on lenalidomide and then data in combination with pomalidomide as well. And you, you, uh, you actually are going to present at this meeting some updated data on daratumumab. Can you tell us a little bit, about, or, or did you just cover most of that? Yeah, I think we covered it. Yeah. I would echo Saga's points, and I think the thing that's very nice is Saga led the serious trial, and then we had this very large phase one study with this big phase two component to it, which really both studies validated each other at this 16 milligram per kilo dose. What's very interesting about daratumumab is dose does seem to matter. Uh, and to Saga's point, this multiple mechanisms of action through which the antibody works probably explains why as a single agent it's active, whereas in contrast, for example, elotuzumab as a monotherapy is not. Now, I don't have the label in front of me, but uh, if I recall, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's obviously more restrictive because it's phase two trials. Right. Uh, does anybody have one of a shot of what the label says there? So three lines of prior therapy or refractory to both a PI and an IMID. Yep. So three lines of prior therapy or refractory to both. And what does refractory mean just for everybody's clarity? Well, by IMWG criteria, it's progression while receiving therapy or within 60 days. Okay, so this is probably, at least for the uh, for now, going to be used in a, a more heavily pretreated population. Um, I want to talk about the infusions in a second. So actually, let's do that now. Let's talk about the infu toxicity of the drug. Do you want to hear the, the POM drug. data first? Sure. Did I interrupt? <laughs> no. I, he hasn't had a chance to tell us no, the POM no. story yet. Well, let's go ahead with that. Well, I think one of the, two of the interesting things you didn't take credit for from your study, single agent, was that the overall s survival of that population was actually pretty impressive. Um, and even if though the PFS was short, and there's question that maybe because of a long half-life of these monoclonals, perhaps salvage therapies might be more efficacious. But also I think one of the, the preclinical uh, findings that are coming out with me in terms of mechanism of action of DARA is potentially uh, this T-cell clone that may come out by perturba perturbation of the, the different regulatory cells. And that clone seems to correlate with response. And I bring that up because um, in ASCO there was a presentation that CD38 is also upregulated by POM. So it's a both preclinical and clinical rationale for combining them. And what we found was that in a large, uh, it's uh, now 100 patients have been accrued and we'll be presenting the 75 patient data. But as you would expect, the response rate was doubled with, with the addition of DARA and the PFS was not yet reached its early follow-up. But So, so there's, just to clarify, pomalidomide daratumab with steroids? Yes. 60% uh, response rate? 65. 65 in, in, the, in the abstract, and it'll be and a little are, bit better. Is this the same population as the um, pomalidomide dexamethasone was originally tested, so quadrifractory? Yes, and well, so this, by triple, def triple it was similar to the POM population, right? So there was That's maybe I mean, four yeah. lines of yeah. therapy, yeah. Um, and they about 65% were double refractory to both len and bortezomib. All right, and exciting. Several from our center were 17P deleted. Yeah. So, I mean, so, I think it's not a cherry-picked group of people. Very nice. And let's talk about uh, any toxicity to this drug, daratumumab. I think it's minimal. I mean, the two things that are to be aware about, particularly for the coming oncologist, is number one, the red cell implications. So the DARA coats the red cells, and it makes the indirect coombs or type in screen look positive across the board, making difficult to find a blood. But we actually have a poster showing that it's more of an artifact, and you can either phenotype the blood before transfusion or 
there's some um, laboratory agents like DTT which can strip the DARA off the red cells and allow more accurate typing. With those interventions, there have been no complications with transfusions. And then the second thing is the infusion-related reactions, which are typically grade one, grade two, manageable with dose And what are those? Because they're a little bit different to some of the other antibodies we use. You know, Paul, you, what, what have you experienced with Well, that? I think that the, the important thing about the infusions are that they're obviously substantially longer than we do with elotuzumab, but for How good reason. How long does the infusion take? Well, it varies. I mean, the thing is you start initially, and it can last a whole day, um, and then you have, you can, there is an effort to sort of tit titrate and pull back, and there is actually ongoing studies now looking at subcutaneous dosing to do it, but this is, we're, we're talking up to 12-hour infusion times, and now we're bringing it back, so it's a substantially longer than elo. Having said that, with the appropriate pre-medication, you can have these early first dose type effects, but then they seem to not be an issue. And one of the most interesting things is the use of potentially leukotriene inhibitors for some of the pulmonary symptoms, which is more histaminergic that may be an issue. So those are, I, I've, I've read or seen it's a sort of scratchy throat, uh, sometimes yes, absolutely. Some, and some even of, throat swelling a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. more, more of a sort of a COPD, sort of asthmatic type picture, but they, they were seen it early in the phase one. We, we saw some of this and then quickly got on top of it with appropriate pre-medication and so on. So it's not, a, not it's really not the issue um, that I think it, you know, some people have said, oh my goodness, no, it isn't. In CD30, um, I remember we started yeah. one of the trials. It is expressed on the bronchial lining. It, it, yeah. The time, yeah. yeah. I just want to clarify, the vast majority of patients that we've treated, uh, probably across all the DARA studies, maybe 70, the median infusion in the first is probably about seven to eight hours. So right. I think it's manageable yes. during a day. Yeah, and then you can come pull back. Right. So the key Six is, is the official number. Though, for right. Six right. is the official number. <laughs> yeah. So just from a practical perspective, mm. though, if you're going to do this, you have to start in the morning as yes. opposed to starting an infusion two or three in the afternoon. And that's just, uh, I think, really relevant because your infusion clinics close at five think, or six, yeah, and so you have that, to start. So I think the, the relevant point of the practicing physician is start early in the morning, pre-medicate, yes. be yeah. aware that you can get some of this bronco bronchial irritation, yeah. uh, don't be surprised by it, pre, you know, in, slow the infusion down in half, right. re-premedicate re and you should be fine, but plan on it, it could take up to you know, six hours on, on average, but sometimes it could go longer. Yeah, so. I mean, I think, so, so the, the, the expression of 38 is probably most relevant on basophils, which mm. may mediate a lot yeah, of the yeah, sinus stuff. Point, yeah. um, and so, you know, you treat it like you would an allergic yeah, yeah. All right, so we're really excited about this one. So, uh, and if I make yep. one one additional study to mention with DARA is the lenalidomide platform as well, because that data is being presented at the meeting as well, and it sort of echoes very much what. I well, this this is where I was to. going with this. The, yeah. That um, yep. the approval is a single agent, mm. but thirty percent response rate in a sort of is, mm. isn't that you know we'd like to do better, right? Yep. So, um, are you going to use as a single agent, or are we going to go? which is what the label allows us to do officially? Or do you think people will quickly move to combinations? So I think the randomized phase three data, if you're going to be talking about that, really still supports if you're going to be moving it up front um, with lenalidomide plus Well, even in the relapsed refractory setting, are you, are you going to add cyclophosphamide or carfilzomib or pomalidomide or ixazomib? Dr. Dr. Usmani's mm -hmm. data will be, in, in combination with Dr. Lonyal, is interesting that the, when you look at the PFS curves for the DARA patients, it splits up into three groups. The ones who respond do great. The stable disease minimal response, they actually do pretty well. They may not, and I think it's important in a quad refractory, relapsed refractory, stable disease that's durable is also a meaningful benefit. And I think it's that the problem is we don't know who those few, that third of patients that progress very quickly may not even get a chance to benefit from DARA. So I think in the very fulminantly progressing patient, I probably would do combination therapy, admittedly off-label. But if somebody quadrifactory, perhaps. And, and Najah, if I may just be a little careful there, because what we have for combinations is POM, Correct. REV, and bortezomib. We actually don't have data yet on carfilzomib with, no. with, with, no. with DARA. I can't um, imagine it's coming shortly. Well, well, the we only need to find the doses. Oh, my yeah. only caution is activated endothelium expresses CD38. And I just, knowing what we know about vascular toxicity, just be a little bit careful about that. But having said that, uh, I completely agree, Ajay. I think if you've got someone who's in trouble, a combinatorial approach would be very rational with phase two data f to support it, yeah. Where is it going? Where are we seeing daratumumab in the next two to three years, Jaden? Yeah, so I, mean, I think we're uh, I'm looking forward to the phase three data and that's gonna really help guide us in terms of how we and best- And tell us this is an upfront trial or first relapse what are both? So I think there's trials both in newly diagnosed myeloma as well as in relapsed myeloma, both in combination with the Velocate as well as Relvamid. So I think we really need 
good randomized phase three data, just because we have other options now with carfilzomib, ixazomib, elotuzumab, and panobinostat in randomized phase three trials. So I think we need randomized phase three trials for daratumumab before it moves farther up front. Um, even though I think it's very active and it will move there, I think we need that um, in the short term before I think we move forward with that with daratumumab. But I think if you're practically talking about a four drug induction regimen, which I suspect we're all moving there now that there's almost universal agreement that three is a standard. Um, the fourth drug is probably going to be an antibody. I agree. Um, because it's just so easy to add. Yeah, um, I agree. I think the other, the other one would be an HDAC. That's exactly. The other, because the other we have very compelling data yeah. already right yeah. now with yeah. an HDAC having 50% you know, CR rates at four cycles and similar MRD rates at four cycles. So I think um, we still have to look at that yeah. as well. So dire tumor, uh, we see moving earlier into the treatment of myeloma with with combinations, and then we're going to have to decide which of the antibodies are, we're going to yeah. use and whether we'll sequence them or we'll use them. Uh, you know. and, and again, I, I don't see this as a zero-sum game. I think there's going to be a clear place for elotuzumab. It's well tolerated, and it's, and, you know, it's got the short infusion time. And I think to the point, you know, practically speaking, DARA is a six-hour infusion. I think the subcut initiative is really interesting. Subcutaneous, if that pays off, that will also make DARA a very convenient uh, uh, antibody to give.